Okay, well, it's five after. So given that, and in the interest of uh, starting, uh, so we have time for questions and answers at the end, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone. Welcome uh, to the, what is the 14th annual Douglas M. Johnston lecture, which is also part of the winter 2023 series of ESS Environment, Sustainability and Society lectures hosted by the College of Sustainability and MILA this evening. I'd like to start by acknowledging that Dalhousie is located in Shabuktuk, Halifax, the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Mi'kmaq and Ilnu people, the original and forever custodians of this land and surrounding waters known as Mi'kma'gi. We are all treaty people. I'd also like to acknowledge the people of African descent that have shared these same lands for over 400 years, building over 50 strong African Nova Scotian communities in Nova Scotia. So my name is Deborah Ross from the College of Sustainability and I'll give just a few logistical details for um, the Zoom session this evening. For those of you with the bandwidth or the capacity if you can turn your cameras on, that would be great. It helps our speakers feel a greater connection with their audience. At the end of the talk, we'll have time for questions and you may type your questions into the chat or raise your virtual hand if you'd like to ask a question on camera. And I'm so delighted that uh, David Vanderswag and Sarah Sek are here with us this evening. David is a professor of law in ocean law and governance at the Schulich School of Law at Dalhousie and the director of the Marine and Environmental Law Institute. And Sarah Sek is the associate professor of law and the Keddy Chair in Human Rights at Dalhousie. And she's taking time out of her sabbatical this evening to be with us. And she will moderate the question and answers after the talk. So David, over to you. Thanks, Deborah. Just a few general introductory words before introducing our speaker. Uh, first, a few words about Douglas M. Johnson. Uh, Douglas Johnson was professor here at Dalhousie from 1972 and 15 years thereafter, uh, after coming from Dal Yale Law School with his doctorate. Uh, he laid the foundation really for many of our research and uh, teaching programs that we still have today. In 1974, he founded the Marine Environmental Law teaching program called MELP. Uh, and we're still the only law school in the world, I think, that offers certificates, special certificates in both marine law and environmental law uh, to JD students, first uh, law students. Um, he actually established the uh, doctoral program at Dalhousie Law School. Uh, he also undertook leading that research in international law, international environmental law, uh, boundary making law, uh, law of the sea, international fisheries law, and he really laid the foundation, laid the seeds for the establishment of our Marine Environmental Law Institute, a formal university institute established in 2004 at Dalhousie. Uh, Douglas Johnson went on his teaching career to finish up the University of Victoria and National University of Singapore. His last book uh, is still a classic of international law. It's called The Historical Foundations of uh, World Order, The Tower and the Arena. And uh, it was actually given a posthumous award by the American Society of International Law uh, in 2008. Uh, and so it, it still is with us as a classic textbook. And it really kind of, if you haven't read it, you should read it. It talks about the need for the rule of law to ensure social justice and social environmental justice around the world. Uh, unfortunately, Douglas passed away at the age of 75 in 2006. Um, a second general introductory comment uh, maybe we can see the slide of our sponsors. Uh, again, we have the College of Sustainability, also Marine Affairs Program, the McCacker Institute for uh, Policy, Public Policy and Governance, all co-sponsoring this uh, lecture. So thanks to all of them. And then the final slide, I wanna make a special brief tribute to uh, memorial tribute to Meinhard Dewell. As many of you probably know, Professor Dewell passed away in a very unexpected tragic accident with his bike, with a car accident uh, back in September, 2022. Uh, Meinhard was a leading, not only Canadian author, but world author in area of climate law and environmental law. And uh, he's 
his presence can never be replaced. So we want to again give a tribute to him tonight. And again, the lecture is in honor of him as well. With that as a background, I do want to introduce our speaker then for tonight, Dr. Marcos Orella, Ororana. Uh, Marcos is a UN Special Rapporteur on Toxics and Human Rights, He's director of the Global Toxic and Human Rights Project and adjunct professor at the American University of Washington College of Law. Uh, he has extensive NGO experience. Uh, I was surprised, over 15 years of experience, mostly with NGOs in Washington, D.C., Human Rights Watch, Center for Environmental, International Environmental Law, Environmental Law Institute. He's also been an expert consultant to various international organizations and entities, including UNEP, United Nations Environment Program, UN Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights, and the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Uh, he has served as legal advisor to the Chilean Ministry of Foreign Affairs in various files, environmental files, sustainable development files. And I was really impressed that I was even involved in climate negotiations on behalf of the Independent Association of Latin American and Caribbean States. So broad experience. Uh, his educational background includes uh, master degrees in law, uh, doctoral master degrees in law from American University, Washington College of Law. His first law degree from Pontif Pontifical Catholic University of Chile, and he also has expensive publication record. I can't go on, I could go on an hour with his publications. Let me just mention one. Uh, in 2020, he published a chapter, important chapter, Human Rights and International Environmental Law in the Rutledge Handbook of International Environmental Law, second edition. So Dr. Orlana will address a very timely topic tonight, a human rights-based approach to the new treaty on plastics. As many of you know, uh, negotiation began in that new treaty uh, back in November, December of last year in Uruguay, uh, with hopefully uh, treaty concluded by the end of 2024. So let's hear his views then on uh, what a treaty might look like, what it should like, should look like, hopefully. And, and we expect to um, uh, have his talk go on for 45 minutes or so, and then we'll turn over to question, answer, discussion period. So Marcos, uh, over to you. And we're so glad you took time out of your busy schedule to join us tonight. Uh, from Washington, D.C. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, David, uh, for that kind of introduction. And thank you to uh, the sponsors of the of the 14th uh, annual lecture uh, that uh, I am deeply honored to, to join you uh, here today. Uh, I am, uh, uh, I apologize for uh, um, having to have rescheduled uh, previously. Uh, that was uh, beyond my... Uh, my ability, but uh, I, as I said, I'm deeply honored to uh, pay tribute to uh, Professor uh, Douglas Johnston. As you mentioned, David, he has uh, contributed uh, greatly to the field of uh, environmental law, uh, marine law, and international law generally. I was not aware that Professor Meinhard Dolle had passed away, and uh, I also want to pay tribute to his memory and to his uh, uh, scholarship uh, in the field. Um, Plastics. We live in a in a world of plastics. Uh, we breathe it. Uh, we it can be found in the in the highest peaks, in the in the deepest trenches of of the sea. And it was high time that the international community took stock about this global crisis and uh, embarked on negotiations for a comprehensive and legally binding instrument that can address uh, this threat. Uh, what do human rights have to do with this? Uh, that's what I'll be focusing on. And uh, if uh, I am able now to navigate this technology to put on screen the um, this presentation. Now, at this time, I understand that you may see the first slide. Perfect. And my image on the right or the left, both images. Okay, so we're managing to navigate the, the technology. Uh, there are a number of things that I'd like to cover, but time is of course uh, uh, limited. I first want to give you a big background on the, uh, the mandate on toxics and human rights of the Human Rights Council by way of contextualizing what human rights can say about a new plastics uh, pollution treaty. 
In order to get a sense of uh, why this treaty is urgent, uh, a few words about the global plastics crisis is in, are in order. Um, then I will uh, address some of the key, the critical impacts, uh, human rights impacts of the plastics life cycle. Look at certain international instruments concerning plastics and talk about fragmentation and, uh, and limited approaches. Uh, gaps, shortcomings, and so forth. And then uh, talk about the ongoing negotiations. Uh, as uh, David just mentioned, they have re started very recently. And so there's a lot of ground there to cover. Um, and I will conclude outlining certain human rights uh, principles for a chemically safe circular economy that I hope will be integrated into the negotiations and ultimately reflected into the new plastic pollution treaty. So without further ado, jumping into the Human Rights Council mandate on toxics and human rights. When, it, when created back in 1995, this was a very controversial mandate. Uh, it's a mandate known as the system of special procedures or special rapporteur or working groups. At the time, it was very controversial because it was framed as in a, a finger pointing exercise of the South against the North for the transfer of hazardous wastes and their dumping in, in developing countries. This was denounced as a, as a, as a crime, uh, as a, an expression of environmental racism. And uh, oh, I have a link here to a trailer that I want to put in a, in a couple of minutes, but I want to point out that it was a voted mandate at the beginning. Now, this may sound a bit uh, as uh, UNEs, as uh, sometimes is said, uh, but in the political dynamics of, of the mandate, this meant that the countries that voted against it, and those were largely the industrialized bloc uh, of countries uh, in, in, at the then Human Rights Commission, they were doing what they could to undermine the mandate. And that began to change and uh, uh, with the advent and the creation of the Human Rights Council, the winds of consensus blowing in, in Geneva and the reframing of the mandate so that it wouldn't address just the north-south transfer of hazardous wastes, but it would address the life cycle of chemicals and waste. And this is important because exposure to chemicals and waste can have severe impacts on the effective enjoyments of a range of internationally protected human rights, such as the right to life, the right to health, the right to personal integrity, the right to food, the right to water, the right to sanitation, and certainly the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. So with, with the reframing of the mandate to look at life cycle of chemicals and waste, the opportunities for the mandate to engage topical issues of international law on toxics or concerning toxics are greatly amplified. And I am very pleased the, that uh, um, because of its renewal it, by consensus at the Human Rights Council, now the global partnership North-South has embraced the mandate and is very supportive of, uh, of its work. Um, now, in order to illustrate some of the issues that arise in the mandate's work, I thought I'd play this short two minute trailer. I've never heard anything like that a pile of waste that close to a city with that high of arsenic concentration. Nu är det 15 år sedan jag för första gången följde spåren från min hembygd i Sverige till mitt födelseland Chile och ökenstaden Arica. Det är min razón de todo lo que yo estaba haciendo. I mitten av 80-talet skickade Boliden nästan 20 000 ton giftigt fåtverkslam till Arika. <skratt> 
och avfallshögen blev en lekplats. Se quedaron callados los médicos de Santiago porque no les convenía porque decía que esto era una alarma para la gente. Det blir lite grann den här typen av värden man hade framför sig när man startade i riskningen och företrädde de små mot de stora. Det avfall som Boliden skeppade iväg till Chile i mitten av 80-talet fortsätter att orsaka stor skada. I fyra års tid har förberedelser och gjorts inför den omfattande rättsprocessen som delvis kommer till efter en uppmärksamma dokumentärfilm. Vi har pratat om en stor 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 Ja, Lars, du har varit med här och skapat den största rättegången i Skellefteå och Tingsrätts historia. Är det ditt fel? Nej, jag avstår gärna. Jag måste gå till Tingsrätten håller huvudförhandling i mål 10-10-12. Var försiktiga era jäkla miljöskurkar. Vi kommer efter er. So a couple of things to highlight about uh, the uh, the mandate. One is that uh, in its most recent renewal, uh, that's Human Rights Council Resolution 45-17 back in 2020, there is explicit language pointing the mandate to look at developments, gaps, and shortcomings in international instruments. Uh, now, this language is important because the there are significant gaps in certain instruments. Uh, I've presented uh, a report to the Human Rights Council last September on the Minamata Convention on Mercury and issues concerning small-scale mining and uh, human rights. Uh, small-scale mining being the largest emitter of mercury to the environment and growing. In, in my forthcoming report coming September, I'll talk about uh, gaps uh, and shortcomings and developments in navigation, human rights. Uh, this, uh, I understand, will be a first uh, uh, report looking at this interface. The mandate also carries out country visits. I mentioned this because I'll come back to this. Uh, my predecessor had the opportunity to visit Canada. I visited Ghana last December, uh, Paraguay last October, and I am conducting an organization visit to the International Maritime Organization. I understand that is also a first, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So that, so in a nutshell, the mandate key tools thematic reports in 2021 presented a report on plastics and human rights, uh, noting the clear gaps that exist in the fragmented landscape in international instruments that concern plastics and making a call for a new treaty on plastics pollution. I was very pleased when the UN Environment Assembly uh, took on this call and uh, set up an intergovernmental negotiating committee with a mandate to develop a new legally binding instrument, but more on that in a minute. A couple remarks about the global plastics uh, crisis. So here we're seeing a, a, a graph that's put out by the UN Environment Program, the, the, its uh, partner center, Grit Arendelle, that shows the volume of, uh, of plastics that's being uh, produced and, and, and much of it, most of it being released. Large scale manufacturing of plastics started in the 1950s at what, 2 million tons. Um, today, the annual production of plastics is 415 million tons, and it's projected to quadruple by 2050. Sometimes we hear the phrase, there will be more plastics than fish in the oceans. Now, this, this is a global problem. Now, there are only a few companies that produce most polymers. So in that sense, there's... There's a parallel with what at the time was the uh, the dynamics around the negotiations of the, the Montreal Protocol on ozone depleting substances. 
but at the same time, supply chains and consumption in, involve all, if not most, of countries in, in, in the world. So we're, we're facing a global problem that is like, to get worse unless decided action is taken. Now, this graph, again, speaks of the volumes of production, and most of it ends up in waste, large parts of it in the seas. I want to highlight, however, that plastics is not just a waste management issue. Here's a, a graph that appears in a story by CBC News. Oh, that could be topical. Uh, uh, it's a few years ago now. There's uh, uh, new studies that confirm this story. So uh, the, the graphs are still relevant. And as I'm saying, plastics is not just a waste management issue. It is a toxics issue. And that is because studies estimate that there are more than 10,000 chemicals that are added to plastics. Now, these chemicals are added to plastics for a variety of reasons, to make them transparent, to make them hard, to make them uh, flexible. There are various reasons why they're added. The point is that many of these chemicals are persistent organic pollutants, meaning they bioaccumulate in humans, they bioaccumulate in wildlife, they're capable of long range transport. So they're not just a local environmental problem. They, they add to the toxification of the planet, to the toxic burden that humanity is, is facing. And many of these uh, chemicals are also endocrine disrupting chemicals. So they disrupt essential functions of uh, organisms, uh, including reproduction. And that's where these graphs uh, become relevant. Uh, sperm counts declining and approaching, expected to approach zero, what does that have to say from a human rights angle in regards to the rights of future generations? This is one of the big questions that human rights is facing about uh, the scope of its application and whether future generations also can be said to have rights. I just want to put on slide there as we speak about the rights of future generations in human rights law the uh, first evidence of microplastics in human placenta. Now, there's a lot of uncertainty about what these microplastics can do uh, and will do or, or their impact. This is a study from 2021. Uh, so the science is shedding further light. What's clear is that the human placenta, the microplastics is not a place for them. Uh, and so in terms of prevention, in terms of precaution, there are a number of arguments that should be considered there. And then this slide, uh, I want to put it on, on, on screen because the, the, the magnitude of the crisis that I'm speaking about is massive, but despite its magnitude, it is a problem that can be tackled. It is a problem that can be solved. Now, for that to happen, uh, it is key that all dimensions of the problem are addressed. And that includes certainly environment, but also trade, technology, biodiversity. And one of the points I'm highlighting is that human rights are part of that equation because every stage of the cycle of plastics, and this slide shows production, use, waste, um, and then their release into the environment. Every stage concerns human rights. I'd like to explore that a little further in this next uh, section. What are these stages? Extraction, production, transport, use, waste. One point that I wish to make at the outset is that these impacts uh, fall disproportionately on groups that may find themselves in, in vulnerable situations. Workers in, in fence line communities, uh, in plastics facilities uh, that are exposed to hazardous substances released in the production process, indigenous peoples that live uh, in the rainforests of the world where oil and gas are extracted, children that play with plastic toys, uh, 
future generations, uh, as we were just uh, discussing. Uh, these groups often are uh, neglected in the marketplace of ideas, in the political processes. Uh, they're offer, often the uh, subject of uh, structural and ongoing discrimination which limits their ability to participate and influence plastics policy. So if we look at that, that in further detail, this uh, slide shows a picture that I took in an academic visit, exploratory visit to Peru a few months ago. Uh, <clears throat> it was taken in so-called lot uh, 192, in the Peruvian Amazon in the north for, for several decades. This was one of the uh, oil lots uh, that produced uh, most, more, most oil in, in the country. Uh, and uh, it hasn't been in operation for some time. Uh, the uh, companies and, uh, involved, uh, the government uh, speak about uh, cleanup, um, that uh, there has been restoration. Well, this is the reality of restoration on the ground. So extraction of oil and gas, let's recall plastics is, is oil, oil and gas uh, in a different form. Um, so the feed, feedstocks uh, of fossil fuels needed to produce plastics, large, large part come from indigenous peoples, lands and territories who have endured decades of contamination of their uh, of their lands, their bodies and, and their communities. Uh, so the toxic legacy of extraction, the toxic impacts of oil and gas extraction. Will the new treaty go upstream and address this issue? Well, that's the key question that I'm putting forward uh, on the to the negotiations. The next stage uh, that I'd like to discuss is transport. Uh, this uh, this visual shows uh, the Express Pearl. You may recall the the, the vessel that uh, yeah. caught fire and uh, had a uh, this collapsed in uh, off the coasts of, of Sri Lanka. It was loaded, uh, among other things, with with uh, plastic nurdles uh, that uh, contaminated uh, the beaches in. Uh, uh, and the coastline impacting uh, the, the lives of fisher folk and, and others that depend on the seas for uh, livelihoods and, and sustenance it raises a whole range of questions as to um, how are plastics dealt with in the international regulatory instruments concerning the prevention of uh, pollution from vessels. I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, the point here is that, uh, again, we see one of the stages of the cycle of plastics and in instance transport and how it can uh, impair the effective enjoyment of, uh, of human rights. Then we have production. As I was saying earlier, people living in fence line communities, uh, living close by to uh, the facilities that produce plastics, uh, that uh, emit hazardous substances uh, to the air, to the water. This is a slide um, from women that have organized in uh, so-called Cancer Alley in Louisiana, in the United States. Communities of African descent bearing a disproportionate burden of toxic exposure. Uh, th these women have denounced this as a form of environmental racism uh, that can be uh, seen precisely because of the, uh, this, the impacts of uh, exposure, of toxic exposure. But not only that, it's also they denounce discrimination in regards to zoning. So where uh, in certain uh, parishes, uh, so the, the analog of counties uh, will uh, decide uh, not to site hazardous wastes uh, facilities or plastics plants, uh, these are being cited predominantly in, uh, in neighborhoods and parishes inhabited by people of African descent. So the environmental racism is something that uh, the, the mandate on toxics and human rights is also uh, addressing. Each one of these cases that I'm putting slides on has been um, 
brought to the attention of the mandate by the by the people concerned and uh, you may find in the mandate's website I'll, I'll put that in the last slide references to letters that have been sent to say in the case of Arica to the uh, government of Sweden to bullied in the company to the government of Chile in this instance to uh, the uh, government of the United States in the previous slide to the uh, slides to the governments of Peru and so forth. Use is another for stage of the plastic cycle where human rights are uh, uh, apparent. Uh, children and future generations, the slide shows a, a dispenser for, uh, for babies. Uh, the the plastic toys uh, you know, the the lack of information in this area is sometimes appalling. Uh, I've often received uh, communications from from parents uh, of newborns that are asking about uh, how can I learn about the plastic contents or the toxic additives in the plastics of of the toys that I'm planning on buying for my kids. And that information is often not available, which speaks to uh, the right to information, which also speaks to the inability of society or families to prevent exposure. Uh, when it comes to children, there are implications, certainly here also of future generations. Most attention, however, has focused on plastic waste. Uh, there's, there are several dimensions to this. I spoke about production of plastics and then how most plastics end up as wastes in the seas, in landfills or burned uh, and, and so forth. That's one dimension. There's another dimension in relation to the global environmental injustices that result uh, from the global plastic crisis that are apparent in, in trade in plastic waste. This trade or so-called trade often results in dumping next to poor communities in developing countries. Uh, plastics in those communities are invariably burned, which releases air pollutants that are highly hazardous for human health and, uh, and the environment. This slide, uh, is taken in uh, in Ghana, uh, in the coast of Accra, the capital. That's uh, actually me walking in the beach. In December of uh, of last year, a sea of plastic wastes. Ghana has become also notorious, uh, among other countries, for being on the receiving end of a global economy of uh, electronic uh, e-wastes that, uh, for the most, contain plastics. Now, this is an area where uh, the Basel Convention that uh, controls transboundary movements of hazardous, of hazardous wastes uh, and their disposal has not yet managed uh, to close. Uh, so these, in all these stages, as we've seen, invariably human rights issues come into play when it comes to waste, the sound management of waste can, is a direct is in direct relation to the right to a non toxic uh, environment among other among other rights. Now there are several international instruments that concern plastics. There are regional instruments, uh, say for example on uh, on on protection of the seas um, that have a regional scope. There are several international instruments that are. Uh, whose subject matter concerns plastics, uh, such as um, the ones I'll, I'll address, the Basel Convention on Hazardous Wastes, or MARPOL, so the, the instrument under the International Maritime Organization for the Prevention of Pollution from Ships, or the Stockholm Convention on, on Persistent Organic Pollutants. What we see here is fragmentation by region, by waste type, or by chemical type. And so there are many, many things that come falling through the cracks. There are many plastics and their additives falling through the cracks. So let's examine and explore some of that. The Basel Convention is uh, the 
oldest uh, multilateral environmental agreement in the toxics and wastes cluster, as sometimes it's being referred to. And in the recent years, it has taken decided action in dealing with, uh, with plastics. In 2019, it adopted amendments to annexes two, eight, and nine to close what was then regarded in a sham recycling loophole. Uh, and so the, 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 the exporters would uh, label and argue that uh, their exports were for, of plastics were for recycling, but uh, they were not they, because the recycling capacities did not exist or because simply it was cheaper to dump the plastics in poor communities in developing countries. I want to recall that the first mandate holder in the, in the toxics and, and human rights uh, mandate, her, her very first report speaks about the, the dangers for human rights of sham recycling. And we see this still happening uh, once and again. I had mentioned in respect of Ghana, how the e-waste uh, was a significant uh, problem. Uh, Basel, uh, is perhaps the, the key instrument internationally dealing with this matter. It has produced uh, technical guidelines to address it, but the guidelines have a, a huge gap and, and I would say a loophole, a shortcoming, because it, they, con they consider that equipment that is exported for reuse, including repair, is not waste. And so if it is not waste, then it doesn't fall under the controls of the instrument. Uh, now, there, there was a, an amendment last year promoted precisely by Ghana and Switzerland to uh, amend Annex 2 uh, of the convention to include e-wastes, and that will subject the, uh, these, the stream of waste to the prior informed consent procedure of the convention. Um, so this is the key mechanism of control that this convention establishes. Uh, now, that is in regards to in this, the instances where these uh, equipments are considered waste. But that's precisely the question and the problem, that the technical guidelines consider that the equipment exported for reuse, including repairs, are not wastes. Often... So exports of containers with e-waste are labeled as for reuse or that they will be repaired, but they are often beyond repair and they are actually waste. So anyway, that's a big part of the problem here. Now, in regards to plastic, e-waste contain many plastic parts. And as we'll see in a minute, many of these plastic parts also contain highly hazardous substances. <clears throat> this slide shows the uh, IMO headquarters in, uh, in London. What I wish to highlight here is that uh, Marple, which was negotiated in the aftermath of the, uh, of the Torrey Canyon disaster, many in the audience uh, may remember this, maybe many may not. It was a, a tanker or that was a huge disaster, releases of hundreds of thousands of, uh, of uh, fuel off the coasts of England. As a result of that, the IMO changed its mandate to address environmental protection, and it developed a new instrument, MARPOL, later uh, uh, amended through protocols, uh, to address uh, the prevention of pollution from ships. Now, there's several annexes in, in MARPOL, uh, I want to highlight a couple. One is Annex 5 for the prevention of pollution by garbage from ships. So this annex bans the discharge into the sea of all plastic waste. Now, this is a very important development, uh, no doubt. Now, it also requires port states to have adequate port reception facilities. And this is in a way the Achilles heel of, uh, of this annex because 
many countries in the world do not have adequate port reception facilities. They take resources, uh, they take know-how, technology, uh, uh, and many countries in the world, they also don't have the resources to uh, create or adequately manage port reception facilities. So there is, there is a gap here in, in terms of implementation. Uh, there may be issues of design. Now in international environmental law, as many of you will be familiar with the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities according to which one strand will pose that uh, uh, countries lacking the resources uh, will uh, receive uh, financial and technological assistance from the industrialized countries in order to engage in a global partnership for the protection of the global environment. Now, this would lead for greater cooperation in funding adequate port reception facilities. Now, this is uh, on the table at uh, the IMO discussions, and yet uh, no action has been taken. Uh, so that's Annex 5 uh, on garbage. I also want to mention Annex 3 for the prevention of pollution by harmful substances carried by sea in packaged form. Now, it's a bit of a mouthful, but these are things, you know, they're, they're, they're not oil, they're not noxious substances, they are pollutants, uh, they're, they're, they're harmful substances. Now, are plastics a harmful substance? Uh, should they be regarded a harmful substance by Annex 3? This is now being debated at the IMO. If we look at the case of the Express Pearl, if, uh, if they were regarded a marine pollutant and a harmful substance, they would be covered then by the uh, International Maritime Dangerous Goods Code, which contains standards for transport packaging, labeling, uh, managing, uh, et cetera. Uh, but so far they are falling through the plastics. The plastics nurdles are falling through the cracks. Now this Annex 3, it contains detailed criteria in an appendix uh, for the identification of what is a harmful substances, substance in the singular. Um, and so there's there are some very interesting legal questions and policy questions that need to be addressed uh, in order to uh, close this gap. Uh, but I don't want to go in the rabbit hole of, of, uh, uh, of Marple either. I want to keep a rather big picture um, and talk about, continue to talk about uh, some of the gaps, shortcomings, developments in international instruments concerning plastics. Uh, this is a slide of the uh, of the conference of the parties of the Basel, Rotterdam, and Stockholm conventions. I'm particularly interested in the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants at this time, because several pops that are listed for elimination are used in in plastic parts. Uh, brominated flame retardants is an example of, of that. Uh, polychlorinated biphenyls are common in electronic applications uh, and uh, many plastics use them. Uh, E-wastes uh, may contain them. What is interesting here is that plastics are also in, in, in several ways pushing the boundaries of what is understood uh, as the criterion for, criteria for listing in the in the pops uh, uh, convention so the these criteria they're they're very strict uh, uh, and uh, and the example of uh, the chemical uv slash 328 uh, it sounds a bit of like a science fiction movie but this is a a chemical that is used to shield plastic polymers from damage from ultraviolet radiation so that when exposed to the sun, plastics don't break up or, or become damaged. Now, this UV328 is a persistent organic pollutant. So it bioaccumulates, it's harmful to human health. It uh, is capable uh, through long range transport, but that is the question. Is it capable of long range transport? Now, the, uh, one of the arguments that has been uh, uh, addressed in the context of the science body of this convention is that microplastics and their ubiquitousness 
in mean that uh, this uh, chemical is, is now able to reach the farthest uh, corners of the earth and so it is capable of long-range transport. So we see here an interface between plastics and the criteria for listing of persistent organic uh, pollutants. Again, one chemical at a time, uh, if we consider that there are thousands of chemicals that are added to plastics, we see clearly that this approach is not an effective way of addressing the global plastics uh, crisis. So in, in regards to the limitations of existing approaches, that's where negotiations on a treaty on plastics uh, were being debated. And that's where the UN Environment Assembly uh, that took place in, in Nairobi last uh, February 2022 uh, was a monumental uh, moment in time. A, a couple elements of, of background. Uh, the UN Environmental Assembly um, of the UN Environment Program, I could add, uh, was established in order to strengthen the environmental pillar of sustainable development by, back in so-called Rio Plus 20 Conference on, on Sustainable Development in, in, in 2012. Uh, now, has it achieved uh, its its goal? Well, it's it's making progress. Uh, for several years since its creation, it had uh, adopted resolutions on plastics. It had established an ad hoc, open ended expert group on marine litter and microplastics, so called AHEC. So it's a lot of words, but the road tested story here is that first there is an approach to understanding the problem, the science. Uh, figuring out what kind of options there may be to address it, and then a debate as to how to move forward and uh, and take action. And UNIA 5.2 uh, took stock of the work of AHEG. It took uh, note of uh, the Basel Amendments, um, the report that I put out to the General Assembly, the, uh, the contributions of uh, a number of voluntary initiatives around the world, and uh, it came up with uh, several resolutions, one of which concerns establishing uh, an intergovernmental negotiating committee. But before I go to resolution 14, I thought I'd highlight a couple other resolutions coming out from the UNEA 2022 meeting. The first one on, on screen is the science policy panel. Uh, so as we have the, as the international community can benefit from the intergovernmental panel on climate change and from IBBES on, on, on biodiversity, there's nothing similar or comparable in the chemicals and waste cluster. Uh, my first thematic report to the Human Rights Council is on the, and was on the right to science, noting the gap the misalignment between what we know, the science tells us, and regulatory responses. This gap is no accident. It results from deliberate manipulation and disinformation and also calls for the establishment of a global science policy interface platform. Um, and so a panel uh, on chemicals, waste, and pollution. So I'm very pleased that UNIA has moved in this direction. Uh, but plastics is the topic of the night. And so resolution 14, how to end plastics towards an international legally binding instrument. The key elements of, the, of this resolution are highlighted in the slide, in my opinion. So setting up a negotiating committee to develop a treaty on plastic pollution, including in the marine environment. Uh, I'll pause here and mention that there were several states at the uh, Environment Assembly that were uh, arguing that the treaty should focus on marine litter. Now, others were saying it's, it's not possible to solve the problem of, mar of, uh, of the protection of marine environment because, because of plastics if we don't work in the full life cycle of plastics. And that's the third bullet there. Now, the last one is with the ambition of completing its work by the end of 2024. So that's not a lot of time. And 
uh, it poses the risk, as we've seen in other international treaty processes and negotiations in the environmental sphere, the Basel Convention being an example, where the result is our compromises of the last minute uh, leading to poor drafting, uh, ambiguous language, sometimes called kicking the can uh, or because um, or the agreement the, the, to disagree. So the, the UN at times and diplomats at times are very skillful at uh, speaking or writing in a way that says, uh, that doesn't say much, that just uh, says nothing, let's put it that way. Um, and that doesn't solve the problems. Uh, I'll, I want to be very explicit on that. So the INC, uh, its work is ongoing. Uh, as David mentioned, uh, INC1 already met in Uruguay. If you visit uh, the uh, the website of this meeting, there's very good information on, uh, on plastics, uh, generally on various dimensions of, of plastics. And this is uh, what's coming up uh, with the expectation that there will be a diplomatic conference in 2025. A couple issues I wish to highlight here on form and structure, which is hotly debated at this time. There are some who, states who argue that what we need is, a, is an analog to a framework convention that can host national action plans. Uh, now, this is very attractive to many states uh, because these national action plans allow for their special circumstances to be reflected in tailored approaches. It's also attractive to many states because national action plans are a vehicle for international cooperation, so funding for the elaboration, implementation of these national action plans. Uh, now, there's a big question as to whether national action plans are effective when it comes to Minamata uh, on mercury and small-scale mining that relies on national action plans. They have not been effective. Uh, uh, there are issues of design and implementation there that we could leave for the Q&A. Uh, by contrast, there are several uh, who argue that uh, the form and structure of the treaty should establish clear global objectives, control measures uh, for the various stages of the, uh, tree, of, the, of the plastic cycle and annexes that can be modified uh, uh, easily to address changing circumstances and specifics. Now, in this model, some argue that uh, the IMO's tacit amendment uh, process uh, can be of help. Uh, we can get back to that in the Q&A if there were questions on that. But th th so this is one of the key issues of form and structure. What, uh, what is also relevant to, to highlight here is that the, the UNEA resolution uh, that sets up uh, the whole negotiations um, already has uh, clear indications of what it sees as building blocks. It may not use this language, but it does talk about uh, definitions and reduction of plastic pollution and, and certainly national action plans, uh, scientific and socioeconomic assessments, uh, the coordination with uh, relevant international mechanisms. Uh, technical and financial assistance, and uh, s some have also put on the table the idea of a plastic tax in order to uh, raise the revenue that is needed in order to um, fund the implementation of this uh, far-reaching and ambitious new international instrument. I am running out of time, but I do want to highlight a couple human rights standards and principles for a chemically safe circular economy. Now this goes beyond plastics, but certainly has implications for plastics. So overcoming a linear take, make waste approach and move towards a zero waste and pollution economy. Uh, this is a, a, a big challenge. So what are some of the uh, standards and rights and principles that arise? Well, I would like to start with the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, which for uh, the first time last year has been 
recognized at the global level by the uh, UN General Assembly. Now, this has implications for the toxic additives that are added to uh, plastics and for, for one, and also for the north-south transfer of the plastic toxic burden, so trade in plastic waste and so forth. Also want to highlight the right to information. So information, as uh, students of environmental law will very quickly point out, is the gateway, is the key to making informed environmental management decisions. And yet we are seeing disinformation campaigns funded by the plastics industry that has coined recycling as the solution to this uh, problem. Now, I have uh, denounced this as a concerted attack against the right to science, because in actual reality, less than 10% of plastics are recycled. There is no capacity. And the fact that there are hazardous chemicals added to plastics make the bulk, the, the large amount of plastics, unrecyclable. It is not possible to recycle them. So this is a divert attention tactic. It's a delay tactic. It also changes the frame of reference instead of public regulation to individual responsibility. But here there is a clear role for governments and a rights-based approach highlights that framework of rights, rights bearers, duty bearers, and accountability. So what kinds of information are needed here? Well, registration of polymers, volumes of production. If, per, if production of plastics will be reduced, there needs to be information on the volumes of production that is accessible. If there is going to be a move to a truly circular economy, there needs to be information on which chemicals are added to plastics. Well, I spoke about the right to science and disinformation and to also highlight the right to participate. Uh, it's often the case, as I mentioned earlier, that disadvantaged groups, groups in vulnerable situation are suffering the brunt of plastic human rights impacts, and yet they don't have the ability to participate in plastics policy. A human rights-based approach looks at reality from the perspective of vulnerable groups. What does, what does reality look like when a person is suffering from exposure to hazardous chemicals and wastes? And that is where several principles stem from. Prevention and precaution have been elaborated in the environmental field and have now been accepted and incorporated in the human rights field. So this are, raises issues of reduction of production, but also the assessment of, of the potential impacts of proposed solutions. Some people speak about false solutions. So incineration, I've heard the argument, why worry about the plastics problem? Simply burn them and produce fuel from the plastics. Well, incineration releases dangerous dioxins and furans. Dioxins are some of the most hazardous substances known to humans on this planet. Uh, it, relate, it releases polychlorinated biphenyls to the air, toxic ash, etc. The, the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants addresses some of these issues, dioxins, as unintended POPs, through national action plans precisely. Now, have they been effective? The answer is unfortunately not really. Um, the, these NAPs, uh, they are certainly a contribution, but they have not slowed down the release of, uh, of dioxins uh, as measured in, uh, in the air. Now, bioplastics uh, often also come in the equation. Uh, now, bioplastics, they come into competition with crops. So there's a dimension of the right to food that sometimes comes into play. Now, the, the, the key point here from the perspective of the toxics mandate is that bioplastics also have toxic additives. They may not be produced from oil and gas or fossil fuels, but they do have toxic additives. So they add to the toxification of the planet through the toxic burden 
of human bodies. The polluter pays <clears throat> principle, so much could be said here, but I want to focus on one thing, extended producer responsibility. Several countries are establishing uh, these schemes in order to transfer the cost of managing wastes from the municipalities that operate landfills to the uh, importers or the producers. But there is a, the cost of uh, establishing these schemes is at times exorbitant. And so these EPR schemes, um, they're important. They sh should be covered in national action plans, but how are they going to be funded in countries that don't have the resources? Now that is where the global environmental dimension of the plastic problem all again comes into play. Should exporters of plastics be involved in dealing with the covering the costs of the pollution caused by their products? That's where extended producer responsibility across boundaries comes into play. For the sake of time, I'll move quickly to two last points. Just transition. This is a concept that was born in the climate space, uh, but is now finding expression in every uh, dimension of environmental uh, of environmental change, given the impacts of uh, of uh, reform on uh, on on certain industries certain individuals, um, workers, and so forth. Waste pickers is, a, is, a, is an example here. And then finally, on accountability. This is a key element of the rights-based approach. Uh, I wish to highlight two things. There's already a legacy of plastic pollution. And who is going to clean that up? Uh, will the treaty deal with that? Uh, so clean up an environmental restoration, the gyres that are floating on the oceans. That, well, uh, is that, will we as the international community receive an apology or will the treaty take action to deal with that? And how will uh, the liability be apportioned? And then there's also the possibility of establishing cooperation mechanisms between enforcement agencies uh, in, 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 in countries of the world. Okay, I'm now 10 minutes over time, so apologies for that. I will simply conclude by pointing out that the global plastic crisis calls for urgent action at all levels, that the new treaty should address each of the stages of the plastics life cycle and the human rights-based approach is key for a legitimate, and effective treaty on plastic pollution. And with that, I wish to thank you very much for your attention and uh, welcome any questions or reactions uh, that, uh, that you may have. Thank you. Thanks, Marcos, for that tremendously and broad uh, coverage of a very difficult topic. Um, I'll turn over to Sarah Sek now, who is professor of law here at the uh, law school, who works very much in the marine environmental field, but particularly in business and environment, environmental law. So Sarah will kind of manage the uh, question and answer. Um, you can use the chat box uh, for questions. Uh, you can also use your uh, raise hand function. If you go on reactions uh, at the button at below uh, on Zoom, you can hit that and have raise your hand. So we'll go both ways. And I think Deborah's going to monitor the uh, hand raising as well. So I'll turn it over to Sarah. Great, thank you, David. And thank you very much, Marcus, for a very comprehensive um, and exciting presentation uh, for those of us, uh, perhaps especially there are a number of um, students in, in the room I know who've also been thinking about the plastics um, challenge with me and uh, through a human rights-based approach. And, and I know um, they and everyone else is, is um, very uh, intrigued and excited to, to have learned um, so much. Uh, yeah, I was encouraged to ask a question while waiting for others to ask questions. Um, so I'm I'm going to um, do that to start off. Um, so I think what you have done, especially with the principles and in the work, is really to um, illustrate what a human rights based approach to the treaty um, should look like, could look like, um, 
in terms of sort of the elements of the treaty that that might uh, that would ideally be there. But the question I have is, do you anticipate that there may be specific reference to human rights in this treaty? Or would you anticipate that it's more likely that to the extent that human rights come into the treaty, it's going to be sort of implicit in terms of informing uh, the structure and the kinds of provisions rather than explicit? And I guess the thinking behind that is, of course, in the climate context, there was a huge push to have human rights explicitly referenced in the Paris Agreement, and they are in the preamble very briefly, but then you know, then there's sort of debates about the extent to which they inform the actual structure of the treaty. So I, I'm curious to, to get your impressions on, on that particular question. Thank you, Sarah, for uh, for getting the ball rolling. So I, there are some regional groups that have already raised the importance of explicit human rights language in the treaty negotiations. Uh, now, as you well mentioned, uh, the um, there is there is precedent here. Uh, the, when it comes to human rights, there has been much more, I would say, openness. There's still some level of resistance, but more openness to addressing and incorporating environmental issues. But from the environmental side of things, th there has been much more resistance to uh, incorporating human rights language. Now, some of that resistance is uh, inertia. Some of it is uh, lack of an understanding of a what is a human rights uh, based approach. Some of it is uh, also the um, institutional competitions within government, between ministries and competences. Uh, so while the environment ministry may take the lead, for example, in the negotiation and implementation of environmental treaties, should an instrument be regarded as a human rights instrument, that will bring in a whole different set of actors. And so the inter, uh, intra-government, uh, inter-agency uh, discussions become um, a, a reason for many not to uh, to, to want to, for many neg environmental negotiations, not to want to talk about human rights explicitly. In the experience of, of the Paris Agreement on, on climate change, uh, as David mentioned in my, in, his, in my introduction, I had the opportunity to uh, act on behalf of uh, ILAC, which is a group of uh, Latin American countries uh, that uh, share similar positions. And one of our key negotiating uh, objectives was the introduction of explicit human rights language into in that instrument. And so we set out to uh, create uh, uh, alliances and coalitions and uh, engage in argumentation and, and so forth. Now, the, the, the goal was for the objective of that instrument to refer to human rights, uh, but that eventually or ultimately did, did, not, uh, did not crystallize in the text. And instead, uh, it's only the preamble in respect of climate action. Now, this language, nevertheless, has been quite important, I would say, because in litigation in domestic jurisdiction around the world, the case of Brazil is illustrative in its Supreme Court deciding that the Paris Agreement is also a human rights instrument. And now this has implications for the, for the kinds of enforcement and application of human rights instruments in, in the country. And so there is, a, there is a, not only a symbolic guiding value in the preamble and in the interpretation, but also when it comes to actual implementation and use in, at the national level, uh, it, the, the explicit human rights uh, language is relevant. Now, it has been brought to my attention that the Paris Agreement is not the first environmental instrument to, to include explicit human rights uh, language, that the uh, Framework Convention on Tobacco Control already uh, did so. Uh, and so there's, th I would say there's a growing movement in recognition and awareness of the importance of explicit human rights language in uh, environmental instruments. I will lastly point out that, as you mentioned, it is it is not just the, the language per the language, it's also in the design of the, of the instrument. And so even if 
there's no explicit human rights language. If human rights principles and standards can permeate the design of the instrument, that I would say is even more uh, important than a, a token mention of human rights in the preamble and then uh, forgetting about uh, a rights-based approach. Thank you. That was a great, very comprehensive and great, great answer. Um, I'm going to turn first to Anya for a question and then to Jason. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, my question is about the precautionary principle, just given the vast amount of knowledge and research that's needed for these thousands of chemicals and the state of our knowledge about that at the time. Is there, um, do you anticipate a large role for the precautionary principle in the treaty to kind of address these gaps? Should I react immediately? Yeah. Sure, sure, please. Well, yeah, ahead. yeah. Th thank you, Anya, for, for that. Uh, the, the precautionary principle or approach, according to some, uh, uh, has been a, a point of contention in international environmental negotiations now for, for several decades. Uh, and, but its relevance is beyond dispute. Regardless of whether it's a principle or an approach, the fact remains that there is considerable uncertainty on several layers of the impacts of plastics on, on, on human health and, and the environment. And, and these layers of uncertainty result from the, the changing chemicals that are used, the, the inclusion of novel or syn new synthetic chemicals, of the um, uh, different behavior of uh, nanoparticles as opposed to macroplastics. So science is evolving. Now, this is a constant challenge in environmental policy of taking decisions in situations of incomplete information with uh, with changing uh, with changing science. So the the importance of this the precaution principle cannot be understated in in this regard. I I anticipate that uh, that it will play an important element in the design of the treaty. It may be, for example, through uh, dealing with uh, chemicals as a class, not just one by one. It may also be through the uh, constant assessments of the science and uh, and the effectiveness of the instrument. It may be through the operation of a science and policy interface platform that is able to account for the uncertainties. Uh, so, so yes, I think that uh, the, the precautionary principle, alongside others, such as uh, prevention, polluter pace, and uh, and just transition, will play a very important role in the design and operation of the instrument. Thank you very much. Uh, Jason. All right, thank you. And thanks for such a, a wonderful and uh, comprehensive and interesting presentation. I'm particularly curious in light of your remarks about industry disinforma uh, disinformation and obstruction, how you envision or how you hope the treaty will go about tackling the critical goal of reducing extraction and reducing production. Um, and I asked that just by way of really brief context, also in, in thinking about the just transition prior to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, there was the emergence of, of more and more discourse about the oil and gas industry beginning to have to reckon with um, declines in uh, declining demand and, and declining production forecasts and worrying discourse about the oil and gas industry's so-called plan B uh, being increasing plastic plastic production. So running those two things together, uh, what are your thoughts about how, how to tackle that in the treaty? Yes, thanks, Jason. I think you've put uh, your finger on a on one of the key issues on on how is it that the treaty will make a dent and uh, and actually reduce 
the volume of production. Because it is one thing for the treaty to set up a structure of international cooperation on national action plans where states will, uh, in their national uh, legislation and, uh, and, uh, and practices, establish a recycling schemes and collection schemes. And I'm, I don't mean to minimize that because it, it is important. It is expensive, uh, but yet important. Uh, there may be minimum recycling contents and, and so forth, but the reduction in production is the key of um, perhaps even the, um, the, the the litmus test to see whether the treaty will be effective. Um, because as I mentioned, plastics pollution problem is not a, just a waste management. It involves all these stages and from the toxics mandate's perspective, the key problem is the toxics that are added into, uh, into the plastics. So there's a couple of things that I would mention. It seemed to me that information on volumes of production is, uh, is key uh, because without having that baseline and, and without that data, it becomes very hard, if not impossible, really to control and aim at reductions of production. That's one. Second, the control measures in relation to global objectives. Uh, so many in the negotiations are seeing the Paris Agreement as a model for, as a template even, for the, as a blueprint. Um, and so it would establish a global objective uh, and then uh, a, uh, a mechanism uh, to get there uh, accompanied with uh, transparency and, uh, and stock taking uh, uh, processes. Now th that may, that again is, but is that effective? Is that useful? Will, will it deliver? Is the Paris Agreement delivering? Uh, I think that's a big question. No? And the, the, the science uh, and the trajectory of emissions, uh, I mean, the, the profits of oil and gas companies uh, amidst a global oil and gas crisis, as it was, they're record profits. And so we're facing a structural problem where uh, the, uh, in human rights, the, the framework established for articulating uh, the responsibilities of businesses uh, is, is not proving to be sufficiently robust to deal with problems that are putting in jeopardy a human existence in the planet. When it comes to toxification, it is not just the right to exist, but the right to live in dignity. Uh, and so this is, of course, a, an issue of common concern for humanity. One more thing is that I've been looking very attentively at several jurisdictions passing legislation on greenwashing. And this may be an element that directly ties with what you're uh, putting on the table, Jason, of, uh, of how will the oil and gas industry spin its contribution to solving the global plastics crisis? Well, this may be an area where greenwashing legislation plays a role to uh, Con to curb, to, to discipline, to uh, and and to inform consumers that uh, today currently lack uh, the, the requisite information to make informed decisions. Thank you. We do have a question in the chat, which I'm going to read. Um, what steps do we need to take on an international level to have the voices heard from underdeveloped communities that are suffering disproportionately so that these concerns can be implemented in international policy? Uh, thanks for the question in, in the chat. This is another key point because um, the, the conversation at the international level that will result in this treaty needs to be informed by the voices of those who stand to suffer the most by the problem in order for this outcome to be legitimate. In my report to the UNG General Assembly on, on plastics and, and human rights, I point to good practices that are emerging internationally on involving civil society uh, and, uh, and vulnerable groups in 
decision making in environmental uh, treaty making, the ESCASU agreement on environmental rights in Latin America and the Caribbean is a, is a clear example. Uh, however, when it comes to the, um, the rules of procedures for the uh, elaboration of the treaty uh, for the negotiations that uh, have been established here, we see a repeat of, uh, of um, well, what is a, a, a kind of a template that exists in, in several MEAs. So it's an intergovernmental negotiate, negotiation. Uh, the term intergovernmental is often stressed to exclude voices of uh, civil society, waste pickers, indigenous peoples, and, and others. Uh, now, that, there's also reference in the rules of procedure to uh, rules that were set out in the, uh, the Rio Conference on Environment and Development of 1992. So this is more than 30 years ago now. Is this... Um, regression or is this are we frozen in time and haven't we as international international community not learned anything in 30 years about the importance of public participation uh, at every level so giving concrete and real expression to principle 10 of the rio declaration that uh, recast this paradigm of sustainable development precisely to give expression to the right to participate you know that's a rhetorical question of course the 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 uh, the point is that I'm, I'm trying to make is that uh, the 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 rules of procedure they're they're quite rigid, but there are possible entry points for voices of uh, uh, marginalized communities, indigenous peoples, workers, uh, fence line communities in the process. Uh, if we look at back at, uh, at the Minamata negotiation process, so this is the most recent. Uh, multilateral environmental agreement uh, negotiation process, we see that much of the inclusive approach that has been heralded in that process has was a result of the of the leadership from the presidency and the bureau, uh, and, and so we're we're hoping and expecting, and I say we as the international community here, that uh, that the current process uh, will not uh, uh, regress in those uh, in the in that experience, uh, despite the rigidity of the rules. Thank you. I was actually wondering specifically about indigenous communities in light. I think of the um, the um, sorry in Inuit Circumpolar Conference. I think has been making submissions. In, in terms of requesting or uh, requesting greater um, opportunity to participate. Um, uh, sort of on a, on a separate question, uh, perhaps flowing from Jason's, uh, because I don't see other questions at this moment, um, I, I thought I'd ask actually if you have any reflections on, um, or if you've seen anything about the idea of plastic credits as, um, something that might come into the treaty. And, and I guess I've encountered plastic credits, the idea that um, a company would put up money, uh, which would then be used, uh, which would then be go towards sort of the waste management aspect and recycling aspect. But this strikes me a bit as a license to continue polluting sort of like the offsetting and the climate regime. And I was just curious if, if you had encountered this in the treaty process or had, had any any reflections on it. Thanks, Sarah. I, I haven't encountered the specific idea of plastic credits. I think it's 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 interesting in that sense. It's a bit provocative in that uh, the analog with the climate uh, and the carbon credits is, is well placed, I would say. Uh, I, 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 I would like to share the, the following reflection. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, in collaboration with uh, David Boyd, the Special Rapporteur on uh, on Human Rights and the Environment, we started looking at uh, the uh, Norwegian government's decision to allow for oil exploration in the Arctic. And uh, well, there was a, a case uh, before the Norwegian Supreme Court, and we presented an amicus Curie brief in that uh, in that uh, in that case, one of the arguments that, uh, uh, and I think this is quite opposite because of the importance of plastic reduction, and so it will 
starts with exploration and exploitation of oil resources. One of the arguments is, is that, put crudely, it didn't matter whether more oil was uh, drilled and uh, exported because uh, the various activities that uh, in, in, in Norway would buy carbon credits. And so they would be offset. Now, I find this argument, uh, line of argument, uh, uh, that it is uh, misplaced because the impacts on, on human rights uh, are felt globally. And so the extraterritorial dimensions of, of human rights do come into play. These are, it doesn't matter where oil is burned, uh, first. Second, there are byproducts of oil, uh, of, of pollution that affect. Uh, fence-like communities, local communities that cannot be counted away through carbon credits. And the same applies with uh, plastic to fuel plants and incineration of plastics. And so that, that it, the same analog. And thirdly, and perhaps even more disturbingly, there's been a, well, what, WikiLeaks reporting of... Uh, the lack of integrity of carbon credits, where they uh, purport to uh, reduce carbon, but in reality they they do not. Uh, I deal with the uh, the interface between decarbonization and detoxification. In uh, in my I will deal with it in my next report to the to the Human Rights Council in, in September. Um, which touches upon on uh, upon this issue of uh, false uh, solutions and, uh, and, and so uh, or, or misleading solutions or partial solutions in any event uh, the carbon storage at times has been labeled uh, using those terms so I, I I don't think that we should um, uh, rest our hopes for a solution on, trying to offset there's, there's the, the risk for media shifting. So the transfer of one polluting activity to another is, uh, is, is quite real. Uh, as the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea uh, talks about this, the, the recently co concluded treaty on, on, on the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction also talks about this. So it seems to me that plastic credits would run afoul of that provision. Thank you. I, I do hope yeah. so. <laughs> they worry me. Um, thank you very much. I see that our time is 832. And um, I'm, I saw a hand that went up and then went down, but I'm going to defer to um, David and Deborah to see if we need to wrap things up now. Um, I think we should. Um, maybe I could just end with some thanks. Um, thanks. Uh, Marcos, for that tremendous uh, coverage of all the fragmented array that we have to look of international law to deal with this problem, how we're looking for solutions and the possibility of human rights actually pushing the envelope. Um, I'd be great to have you back for another lecture because it really opened up a lot of things we couldn't get into tonight. For example, even the persistent organic pollutants and maybe a need for a new comprehensive chemicals convention uh, with, you know, we got around 30 chemicals to control under that POPs convention. <laughs> it's not even scratching the surface. So I think you really opened a lot of doors and eyes to uh, the complexity that we're dealing with. So thanks for that. Uh, thanks also for those who joined tonight. And uh, thanks again for our sponsors. And uh, thanks for uh, also Sarah for taking time or sabbatical to do the Q&A. Uh, and let's, we really look forward to your report coming out in September. Uh, and uh, it sounds like it'll be very uh, interesting and very useful. I also teach international environmental law, so a number of my students are on the line tonight, and I think they learned a lot. We'll post this up on our class bright space. So uh, thanks for the helping out there as well. So thanks so much. It's been a real honor, uh, David and Sarah. Thank you very much for the invitation uh, to pay tribute. Um, and uh, and to join you, I'm sorry I, I couldn't make it to uh, Halifax this time around, but uh, maybe at some point in the future there will be such opportunity. In the in any event, I look forward to continuing to read uh, your publications and, and to be guided by by your scholarship. Thank you so much. Thank you. Maybe Deborah, thanks to you as well. And you want to say anything last thing from College of Sustainability? No, just thank you. It was very very interesting, and thanks um, to Spencer for Tech Assist and to Lori for herding cats.
and uh, particularly to you, Marcos. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks again, Marcos. Great. <laughs> Cheers.